if we are overly consumed with our death, I believe that is a, an unhealthy thing. But I believe it's a good thing, and I believe there's many advantages to remembering the day that we will all cease to live. And the one thing that I think about frequently regarding the day that I will depart from this earth, which is inevitable, barring the return of Jesus Christ in my lifetime, is wondering what people will say about me at my funeral. What will they say about you at your funeral? When they get done speaking, will your life give evidence of a life that really counted for Jesus Christ? I think what people say about us at our funerals is oftentimes the greatest test of our Christianity. I've done many funerals. I've been to many funerals as well. I don't put a lot of credence oftentimes in what the pastor says for a couple reasons. Number one is many pastors who have a good theology before the funeral, I think throw that theology out the window, and all of a sudden when they do funerals, all become universalists. What that means is in order to just make people feel happy that their loved one is in a better place, they put everybody in heaven, regardless of their profession of faith. But another reason pastors' testimonies are not the greatest is because they just want to say something good. And oftentimes it's not hard because people often act in their best behavior, do they not, in the presence of a pastor. People often on their best behavior when I see you in the confines of the local church. What, what, what really matters and where the rubber, I believe, really hits the road is when people take the microphone who are people that are in our lives outside of the church. Oftentimes our close friends and especially our family members. That's when I think we really learn what drove that individual who passed away. That's when we really learn as to how much that individual gave Jesus Christ first place in everything. What are they going to say about you? Second to Jesus, my hero in the Bible, I think you know, is the Apostle Paul. And he had very bleak circumstances that surrounded the end of his life. I don't think Paul had a big funeral. As a matter of fact, he says when he was about to get executed that most people, if not all people, had deserted him as he was rotting in this disease-infested, most likely hole-in-the-ground prison awaiting his head to be chopped off. But if Paul had a big funeral, I was thinking this week, what would they say? What would we say about Paul if the microphone were given to us at Paul's funeral? I think it would be stuff like, and it would probably kill Paul, wouldn't it? I mean, he, he would not want anything probably good said about him, especially if the glory was going to him and not to the Lord. But I think they'd speak of his, his godly character. He was just a godly man, wasn't he? They'd speak of him as a, a loyal friend. They'd speak of his passion to win the lost without Christ to the gospel. They'd speak of his love for the church. They speak of the service that he did in the name of Christ. But I think the one thing that I would speak about if the microphone were given to me, and the one thing that comes to mind oftentimes about Paul is, how did he do it? How did he demonstrate such incredible spiritual strength? What sustained him? I mean, to love people the way he loved people, he always did that. And the people outside and even inside the church would break his heart, and he would just keep loving them. How did he do that consistently? I mean, we could all do it for periods, but he was consistent. How did he stay so focused? Again, most Christians, myself included, oftentimes, you know, we're, we're hot for Christ, and then we just kind of cool off. Then we get hot for Christ, and then we cool off. He just sustained about the suffering that he faced? We talked about that last week, right? Extreme suffering. And he kept taking it and just coming back for more. Never retreated. You know, Paul was not superhuman. He was a man just like we are. But when you look at Paul's life, his game was always on. That's what I'd like to know. That's what I'd say at his funeral. This man was always spiritually strong for Jesus. And I'd love to know how he did it. And today, and next week, Lord willing, we're going to find out. 
we're going to find out the answer of how to be spiritually strong. You know, we've been looking at Paul's life now for um, over a year in 2 Corinthians. And we have to admit that after we've gone through chapters 1 through 11, he exemplified spiritual strength. But now we ask the question in chapter 12, how did, how did, he, how did he do it? Every Christian desires that. But very few Christians consistently achieve that. So we're going to try to find that answer out from the Word of God, and the answer, I believe, is very clear. That's where we're going, okay? So before, though, we, we, we realize what gave him spiritual strength, I want to start off in the first point. I'm calling it Paul's vision. You can see that in your notes. We want to talk about what did not give him spiritual strength. Okay, first of two points. Here we go. As we've been learning... The purpose of 2 Corinthians was for Paul to defend his ministry against the efforts of the false teachers that were seeking to remove Paul's influence by undermining his character and his service to this Corinthian church. We learned a couple weeks back, spent a whole sermon on it, 11 verse 4, that these false teachers were bad, they were bad guys. And they just weren't off a little bit here or there. They preached, as Paul said, another Jesus. It was, a, it was a Jesus that didn't exist. People were believing in Jesus, but it's, it wasn't Jesus. They preached a different spirit. They preached a different gospel. They were sabotaging God's work by leading these young converts astray. So Paul, though very reluctantly, is left with no choice but to defend himself as God's true messenger by comparing himself with the false teachers who had now won over the hearts of this Corinthian church. He's basically saying, they say this, I say this, we're completely opposite from each other. The church is in the middle going, who do we follow? And Paul says, follow me, not because I need my ego boasted, but because I preach truth. And when you don't listen to truth, you get yourself in a lot of trouble. So what he does in chapter 11, and we talked about this the last couple weeks, he gets into what he calls boasting, right? And he does, it's funny, because he does some righteous boasting and some foolish boasting. The righteous boasting we covered is a good thing. We've been wired by God to brag. It comes very natural, I think for some of us, even more natural than it is for others. Bragging is okay as long as we are bragging whereby God, as we sang in that song, is getting all the glory. When it's it's God's work in our lives, when it's grace operative in our lives, and we tell people about what God is doing in our life, that is boasting, but it's boasting in the Lord. That's a good thing. That's, in a sense, what Paul did that we learned about last week in verses 23 to 33 when he talked about his ability by God's grace to suffer tremendously in the name of Christ. And then there's also foolish boasting. That's the meaningless type of boasting. But see, the problem was that's the stuff that enamored and infatuated this immature Corinthian church. And Paul says, you know what, I I hate to do this, but you guys are caught up in all this ridiculous garbage that doesn't even matter. But but as hard as this is going to be just to prove the point, I exceed those guys in those areas as well. And last week we looked at verse 22, where he says, I'm an Israelite. I'm a Hebrew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. Like, this doesn't even matter. But you, you guys are impressed by that? I got that. We go to chapter 12. Context, foolish boasting. He's going to turn the page to another example of foolish boasting. So in chapter 11, the end, it's kind of ethnic pedigree. Beginning of chapter 12, now it's spiritual pedigree. Okay? That's the setup. Here we go. Verse 1. Boasting is necessary though it is not profitable. Okay? But you want some boasting? I don't want to do it. He says, I'll go on. I'm going on to another subject now. I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. In other words, it appears to be the fact that these false teachers were talking about the visions and revelations they had, and Paul says, I've had them as well. It's not good, though. But it's necessary because Paul says that the desperate situation I find myself in But if I have to boast about visions and revelations, it leaves us, as the NIV puts it, that many of you use, with nothing to be gained. Or as NASB puts it, nothing profitable. Now, did you you just hear what Scripture says? 
Boasting in visions and revelations leaves you with nothing to be gained. When Paul was asked if he were a Christian, do you know what he used to prove his testimony? And he did it frequently throughout Scripture. His testimony. How he was saved. If you ask people on the street today, are you a Christian? They'll say yes, and you say, well, how do I know that? And frequently, they will use as a badge of honor a vision that they had from the Lord. God spoke to me. In a dream last night, God told me. I went to heaven and I came back. I'll come back to that one a little bit later on. The stuff that people say today is the very stuff that Paul says in Scripture is unprofitable. Why are they unprofitable? Why? Well, for our day and age, they're unprofitable because I don't believe they exist anymore. You know, God did visions and revelation. He did miraculous gifts. But do you realize that they only happened during three very short periods of biblical history? It wasn't this ongoing thing. You had the prophetic time in the middle. You had Moses and Joshua at the beginning. You had Jesus and the apostles. Then those periods ended. They came for a specific purpose during a specific time when God communicated through those means. But now they're done. Why are they done? Because Scripture has been completed. We don't need to add or supplement Scripture. Scripture is done. Genesis beginning, Revelation end. It's done. God has spoken. God still speaks to us through the Word of God. And it's also done because Who's allowed to get the final say? You or Jesus? Hebrews 1, God spoke to us in many ways in the past, but now Jesus has spoken. You can't top Jesus' words. They're also unprofitable because they're not beneficial to others in the church. What if I pulled you aside and said, you know what, I, I was praying the other day and God gave me a vision, and he told me that you need to sell everything you have and within three weeks, move to the Congo and be a missionary. Would you do it? I doubt any of you would do that. But, but I, think, I think most of you, if God really said that you would, I believe you would, you'd be obedient. But you'd be looking at me and saying, how do I know God said that? He didn't say, why didn't he say it to me? This is the problem when people say, God told me. You, you, you can't verify the experience. How, how do I know he truly told you that? I, mean, I think people are also left wondering, why hasn't he spoken to me like the way he speaks to you? But here's the reason they're mostly unprofitable, and this is what Paul's going to hit hard in this section. They lead to personal pride. We're covering today how to be spiritually strong. Pride is never the source of spiritual strength. The ultimate source of all spiritual strength is always through humility. So if visions and revelations are not profitable, as Paul says, I think a logical question then to ask is, what is profitable? And you see, here's where the Bible tells us these things. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God and is what? Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why is Scripture profitable? Because Scripture is within the reach of all of us. I don't need a personal revelation. I don't need a private revelation. We can all pick up our Bibles and get a revelation from God based upon the Word of God. It's true for all of us. All of us can have a Bible. Scripture is the final word. Scripture is the sufficient word. Scripture does not need to be supplemented. You don't need to add to Scripture like, you know, God left us out and there's a little bit more that he wants to share with just a few people. He told us everything he wants us to know and it's contained in Scripture. Scripture is objective. We can verify the truth based upon Scripture. If you say something and I say something, we go to the Word of God and we come to a conclusion. It's not mystical. It's not nebulous. You see how Satan wants to get us away from the Word of God and discuss the peripheral that we'll never come to a logical conclusion on? See, the problem, though, is it doesn't sound very spiritual. 
And there's people running around, oh, I'd love to know on this, and I'd love to know on that, and, and I wish God would speak to me, and I think I had a dream last night, and this is what God said, and they never crack their Bibles. It makes no sense at all. God speaks today. God gives revelation today, but it's the revelation he's given, revealed in your Bible, right? Boasting in visions and revelation is unprofitable. People do it all the time. Knowing and applying Scripture is profitable. So as I'm reading Acts in my my personal quiet times, it's interesting, when Paul left Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he did not leave them with visions. Remember, they're all crying. He kneels down at the beach. They're, They're crying. He doesn't leave them with visions. And he had many visions and many revelations. It says... I commend you to God, and here it is, his word of grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are being sanctified. So why do so many Christians today have this completely backwards? I find it, beloved, so interesting that despite having visions that the only time Paul ever refers to one of his visions in Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he brings it up with great reluctance. And he kind of covers that in verse 6, meaning, I hate to do it, it's true, but it's just not good. This wasn't a a, a wimpy vision either. In, in, In 12.7, he speaks of it as surpassing greatness. But he kept his mouth closed as it pertained to this one. He says in verse 2, it happened 14 years ago. Talk about the ability to keep a secret, right? Wow. If someone had a vision like that in today's church, oh, man. They're running to the publishing houses, right? There's a lucrative contract waiting for you. That's a best-selling book. 14 years, he doesn't say anything. Paul wasn't interested in that doesn't build up the church, doesn't validate his calling as an apostle. It's not necessary for successful ministry. I'm thinking he lived, according to Acts 18, with the Corinthians for 18 months, and this is the first time they're hearing about it. So you say, why is he breaking silence now? Because the church got to the point where he said, this is vitally necessary based upon the spiritual stability of this flock. I've got to go here now. He doesn't want to. His biggest concern, as I said earlier, is that it's going to make him prideful. And that's what visions oftentimes do. God spoke to me, but he has not spoken to you. I don't need the Bible. God talks to me directly. That's such a tool for, and Paul knew that the moment I share this, Satan's going to want to have a field day with my heart. So when he speaks of this, isn't this interesting? He speaks of the vision in the third person. Isn't that weird? Verse two, I know a man. Verse two, such a man. Verse three, such a man. Verse five, such a man. That's left a lot of commentators to say, you know, maybe it really wasn't Paul's vision. He's talking about somebody else's. We'll see next week that that interpretation is impossible, especially verse 6 and verse 7. He's talking about himself. But he's so humble and so scared to go down these roads that he knows will lead to pride that he can't even speak of himself in the first person. You say, what's the vision? It's a good one. Paul says, I went to heaven. I, I, I saw heaven. You say... Did he go up there in his body? He goes, I don't know if it was in the body. Meaning my old body and soul. I don't know. Body and soul. I don't know. He, he says maybe it was out of the body, meaning my, my body was here, my soul went only. I, I don't even know. But he speaks with confidence that he sees what he calls the third heaven. Now, what's the third heaven? This was a Jewish way of thinking. The first heaven was the atmospheric air, Right? where the birds and the planes fly and we breathe air. The second heaven was the interplanetary heaven. That would be where the celestial bodies are, stars and the moon, the sun and all that. 
The third heaven then is another dimension. That is what we would call the abode of God. So we think of heaven, that's the third heaven. And there's confirmation that that's the heaven he's talking about because in verse 4, he calls the place what? Paradise. You only see that word a couple times in the New Testament. One time is Revelation 2.7, uh, where Jesus said, he talks about the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. And then the common one we all know about, Luke 23.43, when Jesus turns to that repentant thief on the cross and says, today you'll be with me where? In paradise. It's heaven. So what do you hear? He calls it in verse 4, inexpressible words. I think what he means by that is these are words that I just can't even put in an earthly language. You say, man, you should have tried. No. Uh, no. Uh. He says, if I could repeat them, verse 4, I was not permitted by God to speak them. Plus, I'm going to show you, show you something. You won't be able to communicate it. It's going to blow your mind. And when you come back to reality, I don't want you to tell anybody the specifics. Not allowed to. So, so what this did, and that's what I think this is so big, is it, it, it enabled God to ensure that the basis for an apostle or the, the validity of any other Christian's testimony or faith does not center on um, mystical experiences. It's not about mystical experiences. God's not impressed. I, do you find it amazing or is it just me? That when Lazarus was um, brought back from the dead, remember that? Jesus, book of John. And he was in the grave for, was it like three days or so? That he comes back and we got dialogue of Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and there's conversation. There's nothing about his experience in heaven, in scripture. There's a reason God wants us quiet on this area. And it's amazing, too, when I think about that the Apostle Paul has an encounter with heaven, and then I think about all these books that are available today that are flying off the bookshelves of people that go to heaven, and they can express their experience of heaven with vivid details. So, uh, the Apostle Paul can't speak. He can't even put into words, and he's never permitted to speak, but a, but a little four-year-old child can God wants you to know about heaven. It's your future home, Christian. And he's told you everything you need to know, and it's found in the scriptures. That's all he wants you to know at this point. And it's sufficient. And that's what, praise God, one of those kids got a little bit older and realized this has been a bunch of baloney. Alex Malarkey, interesting last name, right? <clears throat> uh, I have a couple of jokes lined up, but I'm not going down those roads. That's the guy that wrote, I referred to this a couple weeks ago, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. Um, what's the, the other Heaven movie? Heaven is for Real, okay? Not that one. This is a different book. There's so many out there. He came out with this statement recently. He said, I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims I did, I never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to do so. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. The guy got, the, the little brother gets it right, right? Bless his heart. That's a sad story too, by the way. Um, I don't know if you heard, what happened was they were, the family was driving home from church and they got into an accident and, and this young man is paralyzed for life. God's given us what he wants us to know about heaven and there's a lot of it in the scriptures. We need to be content with that. See, the problem with these best-selling books, there's a few problems. Number one is they contradict each other. So they can't all be right. Number two, they cast doubt on the sufficiency of the Bible because it's getting me to want to read that to think, God, you just didn't give me enough. And then I start wondering, what else do I got to start reading? How far do I have to go to really figure this thing out? But here's the biggest problem. And I had admit, I have not read any of them. I've read a lot of reviews. I've heard about them. I've read bits and pieces in reviews. But in my opinion, this is the biggest problem with these books. From what I'm hearing about these books, it's a, it's a, it's a um, focus on, 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 on self. It's about me and, and my experience and what it is to me. And, 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 and I get to see 
grandma that I haven't seen in 35 years, and she was there, and, and me, and me, and me, and me, and me. When I read the Bible, there are, I believe, six people. I think four had visions of heaven, Paul being one of those four, and then two people had a glimpse of heaven. So six people in the Bible give us revelation in biblical revelation about heaven. And all those revelations don't deal with me. They all deal with what? God. It's it's not this trivial thing. Like when I got there, he put his arms around me and just said he's so happy to see me. It's all about God's glory. How about Isaiah? You know Isaiah 6, right? And one seraphim, an angel, called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am ruined. That's what Isaiah went through. He was scared to death when he went to heaven. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you see the King, the Lord of hosts, you are incinerated on the spot. God, he spoke to Moses, and Moses said, can I see you? And God says, you can't see me and live. That's the glory of God. If he appeared in all of his glory in this century right now, instantly we'd be vaporized. about Stephen, that godly man who was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, right? But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. There it is again. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That's interesting. Usually he's seated at the right hand of God. Now he's standing. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. while he's being martyred. How about John in the book of Revelation, chapter 5? Then behold, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all of them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. So if he wasn't allowed to share it, he didn't want to share it. You have to then wonder, as many people oftentimes do, why did God give Paul this vision of heaven? And we don't have an answer to that. I don't know. Most people surmise that it was because God knew how much as he said to Paul when he got converted, this man is going to suffer for my namesake. And was it potentially, in Paul's case, during the time of biblical revelation still being written and assembled together in the canon of Scripture, that Paul wanted to, God wanted to give Paul this vision to just provide a sense of unflinching strength, just to know how great heaven really is. You know, when I read verses like Philippians 1.23 that Paul wrote, knowing that he had the vision and then wrote these words, in a sense, they galvanized those verses for me, in a sense. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. I believe that if we all saw heaven, we'd really get that verse a lot more than we do. This world would be a garbage can compared to what's going on up there. Or how about Romans 8.18, when Paul said, For I consider the sufferings of this present time, and he went through a lot, we learned that last week, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. I think if we could see the glories, and we see it a glimmer, we see just a glimmer through Scripture, the glories of heaven, our lives on earth would be radically different. Radically different. 
So, if visions and revelations are not the key to spiritual strength, as Paul said, then we come back to what we stated at the beginning, what is? And that takes us to our second point. I'll be a little briefer on this one. Paul's humility. Second point, Paul's humility. This is interesting now. And we're going to really build on this next week. But let me just tease you and introduce it a little bit. Paul refuses to boast in the man that's caught up to paradise. I'm not going to boast in that. I'm not going to boast in my mystical experience when I saw heaven. I'm not going to boast. That's what the false teachers did. Paul says, I'm not going to boast in that. But what he's happy to boast about is the man that was brought down in weakness as a result of that very experience. Did you catch that? That's huge to understand next week. I'm not going to boast. I told you what happened. I'm not giving you details. I'm not permitted to give details. I can't even put in words. I'm not going to, this is, this is not profitable for you. I'm not going to boast in that. I'm not going to boast in something that's going to make me prideful. You know what I'm boasting? I'll boast in my experience as a result of that vision and how God used that vision to make me weak. Now you see the difference between the two of us, Paul's saying? Chapter 11, verse 30, Paul said this. If I have to boast, I will boast in what pertains to my weaknesses. Then he goes off and he gives us this vision about his visions and revelations, and he starts boasting in that, although he's reluctant to do so. Then he comes back in verse 5, on behalf of such a man, okay, I want you to understand, I'm sharing these things about my visions and revelations. On behalf of such a man, I'm going to boast, but I'm not boasting in the way you guys think I'm boasting. I'm boasting on my own behalf, he says in verse 5, I will not boast in that way except in regard, again, to my weaknesses. That's where we part company, Paul says. When it comes to boasting, to me, it's all that really matters. So they can have their little quick fix. And they can boast in that, I went to bed last night and God spoke to me. That's so easy. That's strength. That's pride. I won't boast in that. I'll boast in the fact that while they were doing all that kind of business, I'm sitting by a candle all night long and I'm pouring over the scriptures and I'm spending hours studying the word of God to the point of agony in a sense. Agonizing over the text. I'll boast in that. You know, um, they can run around with all the applause and all the accolades and all their, their letters of commendation and all the fanfare and the pomp that they get from other people. They can boast in that, that they have a following, that they have a big church, that people really love them. They can boast in all that. I'm not going to boast in that. Yeah, I'm going to boast in how people have treated me. Because I've chosen to serve Jesus Christ. I'll talk about how people in the church, and, and especially people outside the church, have treated, how I've suffered at the hands of people, not got pats on the back by the hands of people. I'll boast in that. They can boast in the fact that they have their wealth and their fancy cars and their expensive suits, and they can boast in their reputation. I'm not going to boast in that. I'm going to boast in the fact that I love the church. And I'm just, I just simply want to be known, as we learned last week, as a servant of Christ. I'll boast in that. That's pride. I'll boast in humility. And that's why I've been forced, I think, for 14 years, Paul says, to finally bring up this vision and only refer to it in the third person because I just do not want to go down the road of pride. goal is that people see his life and that people see his ministry and look at him as a weak man and say, the only explanation for this is God. That's spiritual strength. When we are weak, we have no resources in and of ourselves and that God is working through us to do his work. So where does spiritual strength come from? It's the heart of the sermon. And if you're in Sunday school, I think most of you would share the right answer. It's the right answer for every question, right? Jesus. Good, you did right. Good job. God gives us spiritual strength. Maybe some of you go a little further and say, 
Well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's where the answer is. And I'd say, yes, that's true. But that's a very comfortable answer. That's not the answer Paul, in a sense, gives here. Paul says, I get spiritual strength from God, but only after he drives a stake through my flesh to keep me humble. I don't hear that one very much. Next week's sermon, (laughs) I'm looking forward to this one. This is one of my favorite texts in all of Scripture. Let me just read, I'm not going to comment on it, but let me just read it, because this is the transition here. Look at verses 7 to 10. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, right? For this reason to keep me from exalting myself, becoming prideful, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Ooh, we want to know what that is, right? A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord. He prayed three times. This was bad, whatever it was. Lord, get this out of my life, that it would leave me. God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, I conclude, therefore I will rather boast about my weaknesses. There it is again so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. Because when I'm weak, then I'm really strong. You see what Paul did here? Masterful. He's like, I'm not going to boast in the vision. But now that you got me going in the vision... I'm going to boast in what resulted from the vision. Because God gave me that vision, because he took me up so high, he also brought me down real low, and he has given me a thorn in the flesh. And I begged the Lord three times that that thorn might be taken away, and God said, it ain't going anywhere, Paul. Because my grace is always sufficient for the worst thing you could be going through. You don't need more than God. You don't need more than Scripture. Thorn's going to stay. And that thorn was a, was a governor, in a sense, that just, just kept, kept the brother humble. Because humble people then understand the weakness that they have in themselves. And when you realize that you're weak in yourselves, you don't depend upon your own strength. And then you're more prone to go to the Lord for that strength and realize that the strength is not your own, but the strength that's coming to you is coming from Christ. And then you're strong in God. So we finished where we started. What do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Are they going to speak of some of the same traits that have been characterizing the Apostle Paul that we've been learning? If that's the case, the only way you're going to be spiritually strong, the only way you're going to be that kind of an individual, that kind of man or woman or child, is to depend upon God's strength. be weak in yourself, to be humble, to allow the Lord to humble you, to to understand the thorns in your flesh. And it's okay at times to pray that things will get better, but realize that God has a providential purpose sometimes for our trials. He always does, but for our trials. And that they're there not to complain that God is bad and how can you let me go through something like this, not to pray the rest of our lives that will go away, not to be put on the shelf and retreat from Christian service because things aren't going the way I want them to go anymore but to embrace them like Paul did. 
and say, this is keeping me humble. And the ironic thing about it is, is, is I feel so weak because of this, but actually I'm becoming stronger because it's not my strength that's getting me through the day. It's the Lord's strength now. As I'm totally depending upon him for everything that I need. Pride people, prideful people can't say that. His grace is sufficient. His word is sufficient for all that we need to know about him. And when we trust in him for his strength, we can be the person that he, that he then wants us to be. The, the person that he can use. The person that can be effective in ministry. The person that's not scared to go into a public elementary school and tell kids about Jesus and know that he's going to speak through me to do it all. And to be the person that I believe deep down in our souls we also want to be as well. Let's pray. I'd like to call up the prayer partners at this time. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, my friends, if you are here without Jesus, you need to come up and talk to someone. I got Barry and Patty up here. Don't leave this church, please. Talk to Jesus. Talk to talk to Barry and Patty. They'll they'll tell you everything you know about Jesus. They'd be glad to pray with you today. Today you can receive Christ. Today you can be forgiven. Today you can have the living God dwelling within you. Today you can have the promise that you too will go to heaven. Don't run away. Don't run away. Talk to, talk to the Mormons, please. And also, too, if you are here today with any questions about the sermon or anything that you might just need some prayer on, come up and that's why we have these people here. They would love to speak with you. They'd love to pray with you. They're not going anywhere. And for all of us, Lord, we just pray that you would bless us in this regard. That we realize that when things are oftentimes going so well, and we like it when things go well, but we're oftentimes strong in our own strength. Oftentimes we're kind of going through the day in our own power. Oftentimes we're forgetting about you. But Lord, it's when we're weak. That's when we cry out to you. We know that. That's when we're humbled. That's when we're depending upon you. Sometimes just as people have told me, just, just to get out of bed in the morning, we need your strength for some people that are really down. But what a dependence. Those are the times that we dig into Scripture and we're just looking for something to cling to, to get a word from you. Pray, Lord, that we understand that you have a great purpose in all of this and that through it all, whether we're weak or we're strong, Lord, that we're going to you for your strength, that our strength is your strength that's working and operative in our lives. That's when you accomplish great things. That's when you use us to do mighty things. That's when you transform our character. And that's when we feel content. And we feel like our life has purpose. And we have satisfaction and meaning. And we can wake up in the morning with a smile on our faces. And that you have good plans, whatever those plans might be for our day. What a joy it is to walk hand in hand with our Savior. With the God who could vaporize us on the spot, but yet chooses to be our friend. And chooses to use us to build this kingdom. Mm. What a tremendous God you are. We love you. We pray that you'll get all the glory now on this earth as you will definitely be getting in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you.